My name is John Myatt, uh, this is John Panaman from Diversified, and we'd like to talk about a really cool project in SMPTE 2110 that we did over the past, uh, it was really last fall, it went on the air December 1st, as uh, was the deal. So every project, you have to ask, what makes this project interesting? Well, this project is interesting because it was an end-to-end -end production, master, everything. So. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever watched Home Shopping. No? You should watch it sometime because you may not realize it, but Home Shopping, you know, HSN or QVC in the U.S. or whatever country you're in, it's a worldwide phenomena, is a 24 by 7 live production. So if you're watching someone with a set of knives chopping, there's a person in a studio with a set of knives chopping. And it's a very interesting thing. If you ever remember the, the movie The Truman Show, anyone remember that movie? And you start to think about how would you actually make a continuous television production that went on for years and years and years? That's what these guys do. So they have multiple live studios, so literally there's a hallway with I think five or so sets, full lighting rigs, everything. They are incredibly redundant of course because you know they have to be. And then those feed back to multiple control rooms. So there's two full production control rooms that are completely mirrored. You can run the whole thing from either of them. And you know, the, um, then those feed two redundant master control suites. The master control suites take care of the downstream graphics and the switching between the production control rooms and all that. Those, again, are fully redundant, fully mirrored, multi-viewers, everything. And then we have to make all of the regional distributions because the, um, even though you think, oh, Japan, well, Japan has a lot of different regions and they actually make regional variations that have different graphics and different brandings. Um, so that's all downstream. And there's also, just to make it interesting, there's 24 multi-viewer canvases and there's about 200 unique pips on there. Um, plus then they can sometimes be shared around between them as well. So it's a good size facility. Oh, and did I mention that all of this is in UHD and in HDR? Because it would be a straightforward project, but large, if it was just HD, right? But in UHD, this turned into a very interesting project. Now, of course, which IP standard do you use? Well, in my... Uh, you know, why do you use IP? Well, if you do the math on this project, you realize that doing that in SDI would be pretty hard. It would be multiple frames of SDI routing and tons of wire and just a big, big project. IP, on the other hand, you can buy switches that are the right size. And in fact, this project, we used switches that were this size and we're contemplating whether to upgrade it to the ones that are the next size up. But then there's two more sizes beyond that. So you can really buy IP switches that are as big as you could need for any project. I, I'm just really impressed. Now, of course, it's SMPTE 2110. I have a soft spot in my heart for SMPTE 2110. Um, but the nice thing with SMPTE 2110 is it's fully uncompressed and very low latency. So in a production environment, you're watching the thing, you're cutting the show, you see the result. It's all very fast turn. It's important for sports. It's important for anything that has a live interaction pattern. Now, it's SMPTE 211020, of course. Now, UHD in 2110, the standard says you do it as one big signal, and that's what we do. There are some early projects that were done that would split the signal up into multiple streams due to some bandwidth constraints, but in this project, everything is UHD single stream. Um, audio, of course, is SMPTE 211030, which is otherwise referred to as AES67. And importantly, in every project, there's a question of how do you organize the audio? Do you do, you know, one mono channel for every stream? Do you do stereos? In this project, the audio is organized to reflect the real mixes. So some, some of the streams are 5.1, some of them are stereo. It depends on what the purpose is of the stream. And that's really important later when we talk about how many multicast groups and that sort of thing. Um, there's also 211040 ANTS data from many of the sources and destinations. So that's a you know, nice scale and so forth. The general architecture is based on Arista cores, so the Arista 7504 cores, um, main and protect, obviously. And 
These are nice because the ports are 100 gig universal ports. Now, universal port is a IP switch industry term, meaning that this port can do 100 gig, 2 by 50, 4 by 25, 40 gig, or 4 by 10 gig. And so that's, that's pretty universal. And then port by port, you can choose how it's configured. The switch makers win because they make one line card, and you win because you stock one spare. So that's really why everyone is moving to the universal port concept. Uh, just in time, there'll be 400 gig ports next year. That's another matter. Um, it's designed so that any device that has a very high utilization goes straight to the core, but devices that have a relatively low utilization or 10 gig things or maybe even one gig audio stuff goes into a leaf switch. So there's actually seven leaf switches that are used on each core side to aggregate small stuff into the core. And then there's, of course, main and protect cores. Now, PTP boundary clock is also supported in the core. And this is very important in projects. You've probably heard other talks during the week about PTP and boundary clock. And boundary clock is an important thing for security and stability and all kinds of good reasons you should have boundary clock in your project. Um, so here's a picture, because everybody gets this when you show the picture. Here's the 7504 cores, main and protect, or maybe it's main and protect, I can't read the labels. Um, then these are you know, 100 gig ports, and then these are the first couple of leaf switches, and there's two or three more up there. And it is interestingly you know, wired back like this because the leafs are sort of aggregating. Another approach people take is to put the leafs over near the things they are, and, and that's done if the things they are near the things they're for are actually co-located. But this whole room was eh, somewhat compact. I don't know, how big a place was it? Uh, it's about uh, 30 meters by 20 meters. Yeah, so things are reasonably near each other in any case. And there was an existing HD facility across the hallway that, or relate, in a related room anyway. And it stayed, actually it was in the same room. Oh, in that same room yeah. is where the existing is and as well. And it stayed through the whole project. So yes. they were built in parallel and maintained together. Okay, good. And so, so that's kind of the, the look. And then one question that comes up is how do you switch signals? So because they're UHD single streams, they're all you know, about 10 gigabits per UHD, so two fit in a 25, eight fit in a 100. Um, devices that are in the air chain support seem, you know, hitless switching, or let me say, make before break switching. So when they switch to a new stream, they get the new one, do a cut over to it, and drop the old. Um, there's other devices in the plant that are utility devices, test systems, things like that, that do the other model of drop one and then pick up the other. Um, but we were careful to engineer that the things in the air chain supported the, uh, you know, clean switching. Um, this is a lot easier when you have single stream UHD. If you're trying to switch four streams, it's just everything harder. So redundancy is everything in this project. So there's redundant redundancy. We have live, you know, A and B cores, A and B leafs, and then there's also equipment level redundancy. There's a main control room and there's a protect control room. And so this has operational benefits because they can do training, they can bring up a whole parallel production team and train people how to do production in the B room while they use the A room because everything is available in both rooms. So there's a lot of parallel benefit to having redundant control rooms, but also there's just the operational issue of, you know, when you have a 24 by 7 by 365 production that's always going, you do have to plan for maintenance, you have to plan for you know, staff breaks, you have to plan for all, all, every contingency. And so that's, that's how you do it, is in addition to having redundant infrastructure, you need redundant rooms sometimes, you need redundant switchers, you need redundant you know, equipment. And so that's all factored in here, that's part of the scale of the project is to do that. Um, in the networking side, everything is done with the 2022-7 hitless redundancy model. So signals are dual fed to the two cores. Signals come from the two cores. There's a packet by packet merge. Similarly, devices do PTP BMCA across the two cores and pick the right PTP. And I'd say 90% of the devices in the plant 
support 2022-7 and are wired up and done that way. And there's a few outliers that aren't, but they tend not to be in the, in the uh, critical chain. So a few more things. This is a view of the control room. You can see it's a you know, somewhat compact control room, but a lot of features in there. The switcher desk up front, you know, different controller positions. Um, it, it's a control room. It's a beautiful control room, but it's a control room. Um, similarly, so that the principal equipment, um, it's not an exhaustive list. I'm sure I left some things out, but it is the Arista cores. The Imagine Selenium network processors, which are both gateways and also do up-down conversion for HD ingest. Um, there is a parallel HD plant, so they wanted a number of touch points where signals from the HD plant or the HD production rooms could come to the UHD plant, or the UHD plant could feed the HD side of the plant. And they do use operationally both those functions probably every single day. Um, it's the Grass Valley K-Frame, or it might be a K-Frame X, but it's one of the grass switchers, large UHD switcher, of course, times several, because two control rooms and so forth. Then it's the Imagine multiviewers. There's harmonic ingest and playout servers, um, the Ikigami cameras, the Everts, uh, some downstream keyers from Everts. Um, very complex graphics requirements for home shopping. If you go watch it for a few minutes and appreciate that graphics can be really hard. And then consider graphics in UHD and how you position the brightness scale of those graphics relative to the production. Um, it's, it's an interesting challenge, graphics in UHD. Um, some other things, because that slide was getting full, we used some of the Ross Newts, um, the Everts generators, a lot of direct out Montone 42s, which is a very neat box that we don't see a lot in the US, but it's very popular in Europe. It's a MADI to AES 67 extremely capable little box that I think every project we've ever done has had a few of them. Um, Tech Prism, of course, for monitoring, and I'm sure I left some things out. Did I leave anything out yeah. that's really clear? So uh, John's described the redundancy model. The, one of the very interesting aspects of it is that the two control rooms are there very, very much for the redundancy. And so they actually move from one control room to the other every three hours to make sure that the backup room is fully functional and tested. So they do that every day, multiple times per day, to make sure that you know there's no issues switching in an emergency and that nothing is failed. Um, LAVO is uh, the, the control system over the top of that that enables the instant flip. Even if they've made configuration changes in one room, they can reflect those changes in the other as a function of that changeover. Right. So it's the, very elaborate, the ESM very, layer. Very, yeah. yeah, very, very mm -hmm. clever setup. Yeah, and that's actually, when people build redundant facilities, that's usually one of the questions I ask when I get my little nickel tour is, you know, okay, so that's your DR. How often do you run from it? Yeah, and, <laughs> and John will love this particular comment. IP makes that whole process a thousand times easier than if it was an HDF, uh, HDSDI plant. You'd actually have to build in a ton of HDSDI infrastructure to make that switch. It comes out of IP because of the flexibility of it. Right, so in IP, you can really build one fabric that's underneath everything in the plant, even if you have different domains of responsibility on top of it of who's doing what. Um, so lots of equipment, a few more illustrations. So here's the K-frames, the, uh, not, I can't quite tell what some of these are. There's the SNPs. There's a lot of harmonic servers because UHD. Um, there's some of the other audio kit in there. I, I'm not great at spotting things from the logos anymore. Uh, just uh, John mentioned, you know, the common practice of doing top of rack build with the network leaf switches. Uh, as he pointed out, this facility centralizes all the networking. But what we did in, in this was put the SMP processes sort of top of rack so that over time, as products become native, they come out and they go direct to the core with fiber. So we've localized all the coax uh, in racks. So as we transition, that just comes out. It's not going all over the room uh, between the gateways and the equipment, which is a nightmare to undo after the fact. Um, they were very 
uh, very happy with the, the concept to the SMP because they'll redeploy those for other functions when they're no longer needed for gateways. So there's a whole migration plan, um, the production switches, cameras, uh, the Everts DSKs uh, are native um, 2110, and over time they'll all get transitioned out. So. All right, and that's important to realize in the build schedule that you know not every device was quite ready. So there are things that are SDI now that over time will be swapped into being IP in the core. Um, so that was a big design consideration: was how to do that non-disruptively, because see original comments about you know 24/7 365 they they had a nice window for building it in and then they went live and they'll be live forever so it's another just different view of the same you know mostly the harmonic stuff the SNPs uh, so just by the numbers because people like these kinds of oh how many of these and how many of those there's 200 unique UHD signals I rounded these numbers a little I think it was 203 or something but 200 unique UHD signals. There's about 200 unique HD signals as well. Plus, in the way that this is organized, we created HD versions of most of the UHD signals because one of the features of the network processor is that every time we touch a UHD signal, we make an HD version of it. And that's largely targeted around the economics of the multiviewer. So the multiviewers are able to use those HD versions to reduce the cost of the multiviewer system. Um, so there's you know 200 unique HD signals, 200 unique UHDs, plus 200 HD versions of the UHD. There's 700 unique audio streams. Now that seemed like a low number when I read it out of. The, I looked at the database for the project this morning, and I, it's like, where's the rest of them? But a lot of these video signals are coming from the switcher or going to the switcher. Well, the switcher doesn't need audio, so these, you know, a lot of like all the signals coming out of the video switcher don't have audio in them, for example. So that's why, you know, it's an important thing in the project design to not, don't make extra junk in your database just because you might need it. So I've seen other projects where people would just create every signal with 16 audio channels just because. But this project, they did a great job of only putting things in the routing system that actually mattered. And I think it probably makes a big operational difference because they're not sorting through extra stuff. Um, so if you add all those up, there's also 175 ANTS data flows in there. And so that's about 1,500 primary multicast groups. And of course, there's dash seven backup multicast groups for every one of those. And so that's, it's a big number, but it's not a gigantic number. Um, it's a gigantic number of bits because each of those 200 UHD flows is 10 gigabits. So that's two terabits right there, just poof. And that's, you know, then there's two terabits coming out the other side, too, because it's roughly square. So the matrix wound up being roughly square, about 200 by 200 on the UHD level, if you think about routers with levels. There's about 400 by 200 on the HD level, because the multiviewers are in there. And then the audio is about 700 by 1600. There's a lot of audio destinations, because that's just audio life. And then the uh, ANTS data is 175 by about 500. There are a lot of ANTS data destinations for, I, I didn't dig into why, but I got all these numbers out of the system database this morning. And then uh, there's about 75 more UHD sources and destinations on top of these that are getting built in over the next month or two. Because um, that's the sign of a happy project is they're adding on, so. Um, all that said, you know, this is a tremendous amount of project. And so you say, well, we must have learned something. And so the point of these talks is to, you know, what did we learn? Well, first we learned that Japan is a wonderful country with friendly people and really good food. I, I've never had such great food. Um, and the trains in Japan should be the model of the entire world. I mean, I've been on trains in Switzerland, I've been on trains in Germany, but the trains in Japan are just great. Um, but seriously, in a technical sense, what did we learn? Well, a couple things. So PTP is the backbone of everything. You gotta get it right. It's gotta be like the first thing on the punch list after powering up the switches is to get the PTP sorted out and organized. It is not an item that you can put on the deferred list for fixing three weeks from now. 
because every other piece of equipment that you're going to build in the plant depends on rock solid PTP. So in addition to getting it right, you need to have some monitoring approach for your P for PTP. You know, you need to know if a device has fallen out of lock. That that you know, usually it has something in some API that's telling you, but that needs to get escalated up to be like a red light somewhere because it's not a small problem. Um, second technical thing is really, you know, there's 1,500 multicast addresses, and that's that's a big number, but not a giant number. But it's important to keep track. It's important to have a plan and to follow that plan because you're going to configure and commission this equipment over a period of a few weeks. And it's just super important that you keep track as you go and that you do it rigorously. Um, having multicast address conflicts, you know, accidentally putting the wrong address on two things so they're beating on each other. You know, in the routing control system, we have a place that we show that, but on the other hand, it can still take you a while to realize that's your problem and you should go look for it. So have a plan and follow it and just be organized, right? This is not an uncommon thing in television engineering that being organized would help you. And then the other is that test equipment is super important. So we used a lot of tech prisms here. I, were there other bits of test equipment? That was the only one I found in the database, but I think you must have had other things I too. I believe there's uh, either a data miner, something like that. Well, well there's, a lot there's of, data miner and, right. and a, a lot of other yeah. statistical stuff. But right now it revolves very much around the tech prisms. Okay. And one yeah. thing, just about the PTP side of things, we found that you, know, you, you invariably switch it on and check it all out. And then as you're bringing more and more equipment up and the network's getting loaded, you need to keep checking that you know, exactly how it's performing, how much jitter and all those sorts of things are happening within the system. If you don't, then you suddenly find yourself, uh, hopefully it isn't a problem, but you could be so close to a, to the edge of things. So even you don't want to launch when it's right at the hairy edge. You want to know that in advance. So, it, and, and by checking it regularly, you can understand a lot about the character of how traffic is having an impact of it and do different things to avoid it. So you've got to progressively uh, check the PTP through the whole uh, commissioning of the project. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now for the fun part of the program. Does anyone have any other questions or please have a question? We've come all this way. Yes, sir. Hmm? Okay. Regarding the multiviewers, you said that you were down converting the UHD into HD in order to minimize the economic effect of the multiviewers. Yes. Was that also because of the availability of UHD multiviewers that size? Um, somewhat, yes. I mean, a, a year ago it was, you know, would have been quite a project to have UHD multiviewing at that scale. But also, still, the economics are very different. I mean, UHD is eight times HD in terms of bandwidth. So, you know, one way or another, yeah. you have to monitor the signals. You can, you know, there's many ways to skin it, but if you had to pull every one of those 216 unique pips in at UHD bandwidth, that would be two terabits. That would be a, a substantially more bandwidth than, you know, than it is now. And of course, the first thing you're going to do is squeeze it, and you know, yeah. HD at a quarter of the screen or an eighth of the screen. That's a, typically the right resolution anyway. Um, and so it just made a heck of a lot of difference. We actually ended up using the HD images in almost all monitoring positions, not just multi-viewer, because the vast majority of monitoring is about uh, confidence monitoring, not precision monitoring, and people are looking at 17-inch monitors. You know, and if you know your 4K, you know, one and a half times screen height, even a 17-inch monitor, it's tough to get one and a half times away from it to see the difference. So they really haven't found any issue by using HD to monitor the signal. We just, rather than trying to decide what needed to be monitored and used in HD, we just said, all right, everything has to have that. So every source, even native sources, we required the vendors to include an HD proxy on the output of their devices. Yeah. Um, and, obviously, and a lot of that is still to come. The Imagine SMPs do it by default. and. We expect that to carry on with all right. the other sources. It's really the only practical solution for. Right, for but monitoring. we've also seen most cameras kick out an HD version alongside the UHD. 
the switcher does for some of the signals. It's, it's a lot of equipment does make both as a convenience item, but it's a really handy convenience item. Um, yes, sir. Uh, correct me if there's a daily failover test that they do in Japan? They do a daily failover test uh, every day? That's Cam, yeah. So um, the production control rooms, it's, it's not really a failure test, it's just that their normal operating practice is to switch. So literally every three hours, the whole crew moves from room A to room B. Yeah. But it's nothing, it's, it, it's an operate, that is an operational function. Then on the master control side, it's absolutely constant, dual redundant play out. So in that case, there's two master control switches that are being operated in parallel as a main backup. Um, so they don't specifically do failure tests. They do sort of operational um, main backup switch over. They don't call one control room main and one control room backup. It's yeah, they're, LC3 they're, and LC4. They're just control rooms. But because the function of it is for redundancy, they will not sort of use one room until it breaks and then go to the other one and think it's all okay. So that they just do it to make absolutely sure that both control rooms are functional. Yeah, it's, it's really an operational practice. Yeah. I, I've seen this at other customers too, that if you're going to have two of something and you wish that they are actually backups of each other, you have to alternately use them. Otherwise, one of them inevitably falls out or something and it's broken and you don't know until you need it. Yeah, no, at the core level, everything runs all the time. It's, yeah. you know, you, there's no creating failures to test because 2022-7 is not a failover. Right. It's a true merge. They're both hot, they're po both perfectly valid signals and it's just packet by packet, whichever packet gets there first. I can't, can't keeping track of the, the keeping track of the multicasts. There's a spreadsheet. <laughs> Carefully is the correct yeah. answer. No, there, there's a but there's a spreadsheet, yeah. but there's also a plan to it. It's not like they're picked at random. There's right. there's an organizational pattern to you know certain devices have certain octets, and it's a you know there's like an organizational pattern to them. It's a schema. So it's it. Yeah, and in this one, the, the SDNO keeps track of them, yeah. but it's Magellan. based on a plan made by a human. But the SDNO it learns them from the devices, so it has a live management connection to the devices. That's how it maintains synchronization of its database. So if you went to a device and changed its transmit address, the SDNO knows and it updates and it actually pushes that to all the currently routed receivers. Okay, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. That was fascinating.